Okay. Let's bring that down. Whew. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michael Markowski. Welcome to my studio. Today, we are going to recreate another painting by another one of my favorite artists. Today, we're going to be looking at Ivan Ivas, uh, Iva Zofsky. Iva Zofsky. And he's probably not very well known today. Uh, certainly during his time, he was a titan. And people who know about painting water, marine life, seascapes, know exactly who this artist is today because for them, he never fell out of fashion. Ivazovsky is generally considered to be the single greatest seascape painter of all time. And he also happens to be Ukrainian. So as part of our ongoing series of looking at the greatest artists from Ukraine, considering what's going on in the world and we're wanting to celebrate those great artists in the face of um, a person who believes that Ukraine doesn't even exist, we are going, it's, it's, and as someone who is of Ukrainian descent, it's, it's, um, it's pretty remarkable that this artist uh, who was born in Ukraine and died in Ukraine is considered to be the greatest painter of, uh, of all seascapes of all time. And I will say that <laughs> I feel almost sick to my stomach thinking about trying to make this painting. This is, uh, this is definitely pushing me to the limits out far, far, far outside of my comfort zone. Although I'm pretty confident I know how to do this painting, doing it is a whole other thing. So I don't even know why I do this to myself, but let's buckle up. Let's do um, one of the, the great paintings by one of the greatest artists of all time. This is the way that we're going to do it. We're gonna get the image onto the canvas. I've done an outline on my iPad Pro. I, I traced the original image, which you can download and print for free. Then we're gonna get some color on the canvas. That's what the imprimatura is. Then we'll talk a little bit about who the artist of today is, Ivanovsky, and why he's so important, why his, land, or his seascapes, as well as landscapes and portraits, are so important, the influence he had on many generations uh, afterwards. Then we'll do a little bit of underpainting, and then today's painting you know, is does have some foreground and background elements, but I'm not sure if we're going to be sort of obeying these kind of conventions here. So we'll, we'll see how we go. My goal is to try to get everything done within the next three hours, which is crazy, but um, that's the plan. <laughs> so if you like what you see, consider liking, subscribing, hitting the notification bell, because we often have new videos coming up kind of spontaneously. Uh, um, and if you feel like it's worth the price of a cup of coffee, can, well, price of a cup of coffee or coffee, <laughs> whatever you want, and consider leaving a donation in the description below. There's a, uh, a link to the PayPal if you want to contact me through my website, etc. Okay, so the first thing we want to do is get an image on the canvas, and I want to show you where you can do that. There's a Dropbox link in the description below, and you'll see in that Dropbox link at the very top we have our introductory episodes and all of the material that goes along with that. And then these are our basic paintings that anybody can paint, covering very basic uh, approaches to painting. And then over the next 150 folders here, these are all paintings we've already done here. Lots of Van Gogh and Picasso and Leonardo da Vinci, all the most famous artists. But beyond that, we also have artists from all over the world as well. Um, and where are we? I thought we are... Where is that folder? Am I just totally blind? I know it's, oh here, number 147, right? We click inside here, you're gonna th see three files. There's the original painting, 
as well as a PDF in a JPEG version of the outlines, which you can download. And once we've got those downloaded, you can print them out and I'm going to show you the next step here because I've already done it. I'm going to play this video and talk over top of it while that happens. So I'm just taking a little bit of tape. Remember again, I this is uh, this is a nine by 12 sized canvas board. This is the kind that I do like and that, I, that I've been using many, many times. And if you want to buy that same brand, it's in the description below. There's a link to an Amazon uh, page there. And then I'm taping it down. Again, I printed this off just on my inkjet printer at home. And now I'm using some carbon transfer paper, right? You can get this at a dollar store or any art supply store, or if you want, you can order it offline. Now this is double-sided carbon paper. Just make sure if you have, often it can be single-sided and you wanna make sure you get the right side down. It's usually the shiny side, the darker side that you've, you put facing down. Anyway, there's a lot of detail in this outline, but I'm not going to do all of it. I'm sort of simplifying and um, doing kind of the, the basic, the big shapes, but all, a lot of the smaller stuff I got rid of. And you can see that I'm kind of just quickly going over some of these lines, not doing all the little dots and all that kind of stuff because I just want to be able to see where these shapes go. I don't need, because we're going to paint over every single little detail here. So let's just scroll through this quickly. Whoa, we've already done that one. And then you can see that's how simple my version is from the original, right? Much more simple and that's all we need, right? And then you can peel off your outline and keep it. I always kind of keep it a little bit close uh, so that I can refer to it. It's sometimes easier to do that than it is looking up at the screen all the time. Okay, and maybe I'll just mention um, really quickly that there is a private Facebook group just for people like you. Consider taking a photograph of your painting and uploading it to the Facebook group. There's, I think, 250 or some artists that are already belonged to 331 <laughs> much bigger than I remembered and um, people from all over the world making artwork just like you different stages of their learning experience so you can um, post your work there get some feedback by other artists as well as once a month I go through everything organize it and we do a special feedback episode which is what we're doing this Saturday so consider joining and um, and joining us this Saturday for our special bonus episode. That's why you want to like and subscribe because that and hit the notification bell so you know when those are going to be showing up. Okay, so our next step here is called the imprimatura, which literally translates to the primer or the or priming a canvas or the first layer of paint. And artists going back prior to the Renaissance have been doing this. And I guarantee you that Ivanovsky would have done this exact same technique because he was as old school as it gets, which we'll talk about it in terms of his biography shortly, kind of makes him, towards the end of his career, he was sort of considered to be an old dinosaur who no longer was in touch with what was going on. But if you're interested in learning how to, to, to paint water, then this is the kind of guy you want to learn from. Okay, so what we're going to be doing is we're going to be co using this. This is the brand of paint I use. I'm not sponsored or paid by them or anything, but uh, I'm about to coat this painting with this Azo Yellow Deep by Amsterdam. This is a cheaper student grade of paint. You could certainly use lots of different brands. Let's just take a look at some other brands you could use. This is Golden. They're probably the one of the best uh, professional grade of acrylic and you can see this is the color I would use to do exactly what we're going to do here with the Amsterdam paint. Liquitex, this is their cheaper brand. Windsor & Newton, Artist Loft from Michael's Art Supplies. No relationship to this Michael. <laughs> Buzz, um, Peebo, Holbein, Dyler Rowney. So lots of different paints that we can use to do this process. Um, every different brand is slightly different and has a different name, of course, because of course they have to be a little bit different. You know, it's 
you know, and uh, it's sort of like if you've got a car, the the dealership tells you, well, you got to come in and you got to get the a tune up here. Like I wouldn't go to one of those, you know, uh, uh, third party repair places. They could really mess things up. You got to come back here and pay twice as much. <laughs> so the same sort of thing. Different paint companies will tell you you can't. Uh, mix different brands together which is just crazy I, I have no idea why um, but anyway so here's this is my warm yellow and I'm gonna coat this canvas with it now uh, Ivanovsky would not have used this warm yellow he would probably would have used something much uh, less intense a, a warm brown like a rusty red color with earthy tones and he probably would have also combined this the imprimatura with the underpainting um, so he probably would, would not have drawn out this composition like we have he probably would have done it much more intuitively as he was painting this out so we can do a little bit of that at the next stage what we can do a little bit of um, when we do our underpainting, I can kind of show you a little bit of how he would have done it. And you just have to sort of imagine there's no pencil lines on the canvas. Okay. That looks pretty good. I'm just going to quickly get rid of any kind of ridges. The again this is the only time I ever use water in my acrylic paint and, and one of the benefits of water is it's gonna um, reduce any edges that might form when you're doing a kind of a quick wash like this because if you have medium in it it's more likely to, to leave uh, some uh, texture okay I feel like whew. A little, a little stressed about today's episode. This one is, is kind of is. It's again, it's not, it's not that difficult. In in theory, in practice, it, we'll see how well it goes. Okay, so we'll let this sit and dry, and then afterwards we're going to come in and start painting over top of it. So while that is drying, let's talk about who Ivan Ivanovsky was. So. Let's go, maybe just right off the top, it's just worth just doing a little geography check-in just to show you where he was actually from, right? So here's uh, Western Europe, Germany, Poland, here's Ukraine. And Ivanovsky is from Crimea, um, which is currently under Russian occupation and was uh, illegally annexed by Russia in 2014 um, and but uh, Crimea features prominently in the history of Ukraine and uh, two of the of, of the groups that are often most commonly um, seen as sort of as kind of the the mythical Ukrainian soul and spirit come from Ukraine and those are the Tartars and the Cossacks and um, of which the Tartars are are more closely related to Ivanovsky's uh, historical um, uh, background so we can see this all this whole area right up to the right here's Mariupol and Donetsk and Luhansk all these areas this is where currently occupied by Russian troops and hopefully hopefully you're watching a year or two or ten years from now and you're like there's there were what Russians here that's crazy why on earth would they be here that's that's Ukraine that has nothing to do with Russia yeah tell us about it go back in time and and <laughs> and uh, tell us about it so okay let's look at Ivanovsky's um, Ivazovsky's uh, there's no N in there I will probably say that a, a hundred times today um, so born in 1870 and dies in 1900 and so at the age of 82 and today's painting was done roughly about when he was 80 years old so right at the very end of his long and very successful career and he was painting right 
up until the end, right? Which is something that I aspire to, right? I, I want to be just like him, constantly working right up until the day I just drop dead, right? And um, even right up until that, till the day he died, he was getting better and better and better, right? And which is why many people consider the painting that we're about to do among the waves or with the waves, or in the waves, it's, it's translated in various different ways, um, is seen as, as one of, if not his greatest painting of all time. Um, so let's sort of, let's just kind of quick background on the artist here. Uh, so he's born in the town of Feodosia, which is again in Crimea, and his kind of historical background is his father was Armenian. And we've talked about the history of Ukraine many, many times, but Ukraine has, has, has been historically a country that has been occupied and um, uh, by, by people from all over that region, whether it was Russians or even Vikings coming down, Pol Polish people, Hungarian people, uh, Iranian people, Greeks, North African. I mean, it's, it goes on and on and on. So what is what I think that's what's really interesting about that is just the diversity of people historically that have passed through Ukraine, have established um, cultural touchstones in Ukraine. So Ukraine is is in some way similar to Canada or the United States in that you have a lot of diverse population which is you know not uncommon today but if you go back two or three hundred years having that many different people in one country was would have been pretty unique right so what I I love about that is that when you have that many different people all in in one community people have to sort of try to get along, right? And whereas in a lot of other cultures, which were kind of monocultures almost, they didn't really have to, to deal with that kind of a situation. So when there were different people coming into those cultures, it was quite a shock, right? That's never been the case in Ukraine. There's always been a very diverse population. And... Um, one of the things that that you know they're they're a fairly they're not a, a wealthy family by any they're kind of a, we're just a, not a poor family but uh, they don't have a lot of means but one of the things that is amazing is his parents managed to bring him up it as in in a in a way that he 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 be, he's speaks numbers of different languages he's um, fairly well educated for for a child growing up in the sort of class that he comes from and he also starts exhibiting um, ability when it comes to drawing and painting at a, at a quite a young age and that um, that goes noticed usually you say that goes unnoticed that goes noticed uh, primarily by a friend of the family who's an architect and that architect is like wow these are amazing drawings and quickly thereafter he basically gets a scholarship to St. Petersburg which is a long long way away from Crimea and I'm trying to remember I, I, I haven't actually read the Wikipedia page or done other research uh, but um, I think it was like a three-week journey by horse from Crimea all the way through Ukraine, all along through areas which are now uh, occupied by Russian troops, and um, and all, and he's doing this. I think when he was 16 years old, or, or even maybe less, 14, he makes this big journey to Saint Petersburg to study art there, which is that's pretty, you know, for some kid going from which, which would have been a. a you know, a, a port city, which just like the rest of, again, like Ukraine, is a place that's very, has, has a lot of different people kind of milling about, and um, but it's also kind of a transient kind of place, and, and a kind of a working class area, to going from that 
kind of upbringing to St. Petersburg, which was sort of the the glitzy, hyper cosmopolitan part of of Russia. You know where the gr the great museums and, and art and and artists are living. That would have I mean I just can't imagine what he would have experienced when he finally arrived into into that you know um, uh, cultural mecca. And uh, it's very quickly afterwards, after being in St. Petersburg, that he starts to really impress. Uh, even while he's in school, in fact, I don't, I don't know if it's in here, but you know, he's he takes classes with this uh, French teacher, Philippe Tenor, who was himself uh, a, a kind of an academic teacher. And he, he, at the academy he's studying in St. Petersburg is a very traditional approach to learning how to paint and which which involves like very technical classes learning about grinding your own pigments and the chemical composition and how those colors and chemicals uh, interact with one another something that we don't really talk about in, in art school like the art school I teach at uh, today um, more and more education when it comes to art is more about ideas and concepts and styles and developing your own method and approach rather than studying necessarily from the masters like we're doing in, in these series right um, but one of the things he does is he kind of takes time off from his classes to work on uh, a larger painting uh, a seascape that out kind of both outside of classes, but also to the detriment of his studies when he's in school, which infuriates Tenor, who's like, what are you doing? You're supposed to be here doing your assignments and you're making this big painting because he made that painting to submit to one of the salons. And uh, which is, you know, something that, you know, when we're in art school, we try, we sort of discourage students from, from, from exhibiting too much outside of school because we want to like keep the school experience kind of a safe place to experiment and, and to learn and to fall flat on your face. And so I can understand Tenor's um, objection to wanting to, uh, for this young artist to be exhibiting and submitting to the salon at that early age or early part of his career. But, uh, Ivazovsky was was you know on a, on a path of his own far and above all of his peers and not only is his painting accepted in a salon but it wins a major award and it gets the attention of the the emperor the, the Russian emperor who is becomes in the family the all of the the kind of the most powerful people in in Russia the art collectors and the gatekeepers take notice of this young person and everybody now wants one of their paint his paintings for their collection so we mean uh, i'm not going to go into every one of these files but we're looking at paintings that this kid was doing this is what he's 14 years old when he's doing these six 15 years old here he's 20. So he's 20 years old when he's cranking out all of these paintings. The kind of paintings that most other artists, even during his time, would have been proud to do in their 50s and 60s. Here he's just cranking them out. He, by the time he died, he, he had made 6,000 paintings. Um, so he was not only prolific, but he was also fast. So he, he did great art fast and he did a lot of it which is you know that trifecta is very hard for a lot of artists can be fast um and make a lot of work but it's not very good or you can have um i can never remember you can re rearrange those but you can never get all three together uh ivanov ivanovsky was able to do all three now one of the things, as I scroll through here, now he's in his early 20s. He's like 22 when he's doing these paintings. Um, he also starts traveling in his early 20s, and he, and he starts spending time in Rome, in Paris, Berlin, 
and through those travels he he meets all sorts of people he famously meets jmw turner the the arguably the greatest british painter of all time when he's in rome and at that time turner's a little bit older but um both of them have reputations that preceded them so they you know you have it's sort of like i don't know what that that meeting would be like it would be like um elvis and paul mccartney meeting you know when elvis is in his you know uh, late uh <laughs> hawaii or um, vegas phase with paul mccartney being kind of just at the end of the Beatles, kind of like there, there are two people that have already accomplished a lot, but have very different approaches to painting. And oddly enough, it's Turner who's maybe the more uh, avant-garde of the two artists, even though he's almost twice his age by this time. Um, Ivazovsky as I said earlier, sort of represents this much more traditional academic way of painting um, landscapes, specifically seascapes and water. Um, one of the things that we're going to start to see is there's a lot of the very, the, the compositions and colors all start to kind of blur, right? He, he's one of those persons that it figured out how to do what he did mastered it and then just did it over and over and over and over again which which was one of the things he was celebrated for because if you wanted one of his paintings you could get a painting just like that from him he might switch it up put a different kind of boat with a different kind of flag in it maybe you know change some of the colors so it match your carpets and drapes a little bit better but he was he was quite capable of, of meeting whatever demands that collectors had on him but for some of the younger artists that we'll talk about here shortly uh, they saw his work as and him as, as sort of just being a representative of of a old outdated um, hackneyed approach to art that was no longer relevant in the um, in the world so here, you know, he's just, what, he's uh, 30 years old at this point, all right? And we don't really see, you know, b besides him getting a little bit better over the years, he doesn't really change what he's doing or how he's doing it for the next 50 years, right? Which, again, is for some people, they admire that dedication. For some people, they're like, wow, I mean, geez, you'd think this old dog would eventually learn a different trick, but no. So, again, there's two ways to think of all of these. One of the things he starts doing, especially, and we've talked about this many times, as artists often, when they, they leave home, they become really interested in home and their, their history. He starts making a lot of artwork about um, uh, Crimea and where he comes from and the people there. He also uh, uh, um, he also eventually moves back to very close to where he was born and spends the, the remainder of his life in Crimea. He actually builds a, a huge estate there, like a big castle that he lives in because he's become very, very wealthy throughout uh, his life. So, I mean, like, this is what we're now at age 40 and this is what he's doing so there's not a lot of a, a lot of difference here let me just see i should also you know mention so here's a portrait of him and uh when he was in italy he becomes very uh friendly with a lot of authors a lot of russian authors at the time he becomes best friends with Anton Chekhov, who's considered to be one of the greatest playwrights of all time. And Chekhov sort of makes some characters that are sort of based on Ivazovsky. Uh, he also becomes really good friends with Gogol, right? We've talked about Gogol before. Um, do I have his books down here? Uh, probably the greatest Russian... Um, modernist author of all time uh kind of like the 
the Edgar Allan Poe of, of Ukraine, um, and I, I, who I've been reading, a, like, I just started Dead Souls the other day, great book, but again, they, I think there's, there's some quotes in here of some of the comments that some of his friends, uh, And Dostoevsky becomes a friend and a big fan. So here we have, like, I'll just read this. English novelist Virginia Woolf referred to Dostoevsky's novels as seething whirlpools, water spouts, which hiss and spout and suck us in. It is perhaps no coincidence that Dostoevsky loved this particular painting, The Rainbow, seeing it in... Uh, the thrill that startles a spectator in real-life form. With this work, Dostoevsky claimed that Ivazovsky became a master who has no competition. Uh, uh, Virginia Woolf's contemporary, the writer Rosa Newmarch, traveled extensively in Russia, immersed herself in its art and culture, and wrote of Ivazovsky's truthful vision in paintings such as The Rainbow. Um, uh, this uh, art story article has lots of quotes here by various different authors talking about... Um, uh, about Ivazovsky, but I love this guy's facial hair here. You don't see too many of these big chops anymore, right? Guys with the giant sideburns, but no mustache or beard or goatee or anything. Just the massive <laughs> sideburns that I think kind of connect up to his comb over there. That's pretty impressive. Um, that is a style of his, his own um he he eventually he I, can, I he marries he has i think four children um although that marriage i don't think was very happy this is the 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 sort of big estate that he lived in in crimea uh, towards the end of his life and this is now an art gallery if we just zoom in here so this is the little town. He was born and raised kind of up in the the poorer sections of Feodesia. And uh, I think it's just interesting that a, for a guy that, that becomes the best marine artist of all time, he grew up right next to the water overlooking a harbor, a very busy harbor in which he would see boats coming and going all day long he, going to the markets he would have run into sailors and sea captains and people trading all sorts of things from far off countries so and you can also just imagine not only does he become interested in water and the sea but also the color not just the color from the 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 ocean and the sunsets right the sun would have set every night just right over you know the way that you know looking eastward here but he also um or sorry that would be the opposite way so he would have been seeing the sun rises <laughs> um but um being in a in a, all those markets and seeing all the beautiful colorful clothes and spices that would have been coming in from different different countries and cultures i think that would have also piqued his interest for, um, so there's lots of links here i think there's just one thing i wanted to show i think this is interesting just as we're about to begin this painting you can see that here's the same painting but you can see it's very different color so here we have this one is you know maybe this this might be technically the the true painting before it was varnished so this might be the painting after it was varnished after it's sort of kind of yellowed and turned a little bit brown and muddy um i think some people would say this is what the original would have looked like when he painted it and after cleaning this would have looked close so it just gives us some options as to how we may proceed with this um you we could do one that's a little bit more brown like when i actually i don't mind this particular painting in this state if anything it it i could i could hear the argument for this being a superior painting 
in terms of color to this one. This one's really nice and bright and colorful. But there's something about this that makes me think of like the, the, the what does he call it? The, the, the starts with an S. The salt. The, 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 the silt that's being kind of churned up by this stormy uh, ocean. We can see that in anyone who's, who's stood on a beach and seen the, the water coming over their feet can see that kind of brownish color that sometimes forms. But that is certainly very different than this, right? So I think I'll probably paint closer to this area, but if your colors get a little bit muddy, then you'd be like, oh, no, no, I was just painting the varnished version of this painting. Um, Sandra says, please do the bright one. I love the color. Okay. <laughs> So, uh, let's dive right in here. Um, I think there's, there's lots more things we could talk about, but I really want to get to painting because uh, uh, there's, there's some work to do. <laughs> so, the next stage here is we're going to do a little bit of underpainting. And as I mentioned, I do think it's, it's likely that when he did his imprematura that he would have done a little bit of underpainting at the exact same time. Now... Um, how he would have done that. Let's just take a zoom in and see if we can find any uh, information in here in this painting. I'm wondering some of these darker areas or the potentially how he would have done that. So I think what I'm just looking for is trying to see, can I see any hints of the steps and stages that he used in here? And I can't really see anything, which is not, you know, doesn't surprise me because for an artist like this, part of their magic is the is creating a painting that is not easily reverse engineered which is what i'm generally trying to do every single episode is to try to kind of pull the the layers back to try to see if we can get to the first one and then work our way back towards the finished painting um that more academic approach that he used is almost designed to make it reverse engineered proof you sort of you're kind of high by using very thin glazes you can kind of hide the construction of the painting um so let's let's get some paint on the palette here and then i'll just sort of think a little bit maybe out loud i think what i'll do I'll, i'm going to mix a darker color but maybe not the darkest color and use that as um, um, my my method for doing this painting. Now, I think probably like, you know, if you're painting a seascape, the, what might occur to people is like, well, I'll just get a lot of blue and we'll just do finish this painting real quick. <laughs> Maybe, maybe, um, depending on the painting you're doing, I suppose. But a painting like this will uh, require actually probably a more diverse palette than you may think, at least at first. So I just cut this tube out. I love getting all the way to the bottom of a tube of paint. So what I'm basically doing here is creating a dark color. I can make a black with this. We're not going to use that much black. We're going to basically make this black and then we can tint it and turn it into a gray. But basically we've got our warm red, our cool blue, and cool yellow. And we mix these guys together. And we're going to get something really dark. Right now it's very brown. 
that's probably because I put a lot of red and yellow in here and, and less blue. that color transforming it's still kind of a little bit more on the brown side of things one of the things that I'm I've just started to do is at the end of the night I uh, scoop out the I've been using all my extra paint for a while to, to work on my Jay DeFeo painting which you may recall right this big thick goopy painting right and this is what I, I do with all my extra paint at the end of the night we did this episode months and months ago but I usually scoop all this extra paint onto here and get this really nice textury canvas but I also have been saving all of my my black as well which is what we've got right here now so let's take Lots of comments in the chat there. You guys are busy. Okay. So the next thing I want to do is I think I'm going to make this color just a little bit more on the blue side. All right. So let's take some of our cool blue. And then I'll mix my dark color into the cool blue. So this way we'll still have a dark color, but it's not a black. It's a little bit more of a, like a blue dominant um, very dark black and then I'm going to take a smaller paintbrush and I'm going to use this to do some of my under painting okay so as I said I imagine he would have painted something maybe not even too like maybe a little bit yellowy like this and then he would have then taken probably a darker color and then just kind of gone around and started to probably just divide the space up. Like, so probably starting around here, like, okay, let's make this the horizon. Clouds. And this dark shape up here. So just this. So just you have to just imagine there's no pencil lines on here. This is just him sort of probably doing exactly what I'm doing here. Kind of breaking it up into spaces.
Okay. Oh, and then he's got his big radiating light sun coming, or sunlight beam coming out of the heavens here. Now, he did this kind of technique a lot. He liked this ray of light bursting through the clouds. Um, so that was sort of one of his kind of stylistic approaches. Now, there's he wasn't the only person to do that. That's, that's a pretty common um, landscape painter's kind of compositional tool. But he definitely, you know, really embraced it for sure. So that would be what I would consider for this painting to be a pretty good underpainting. Now, we could do all these little details. I'm just going to leave it like that and, and just see as it develops. We'll, we'll still see, we'll see less and less of, the, of all of these lines as we paint subsequent layers. Um, but these I'm going to make as kind of my structural um, landmarks here. And then... Which may, if you did this painting, you might have done, seen something a little bit different than what I did. And that's totally fine, right? They can always be a little bit different. They should be all a little bit different. We're, we're not robots after all, right? Um, so... Creating says, good evening from the Netherlands. This is a beautiful but very difficult painting. <laughs> yes, you are right, my friend. It's uh, This one's a challenge for sure. But I think we're up for it. I think, you know, what is amazing about this artist is that not only was he able to get these effects, but he was able to do it really fast. Like, he's known for... Being like he did a um, uh, a presentation, I think it was in London, perhaps, or maybe it was in Paris, where he made one of these large paintings in a couple of hours during a class, and everyone was just sitting around like, "Oh my goodness!" Like, how does like it's just like watching, I don't know, a magician at work or a great chef. You know when. I, my wife and I love watching those cooking shows and you see like, you know, uh, Iron Chef and, and they're, they've they got to chop up like, I don't know, um, debone uh, uh, something or they've got to chop up 20 pounds of potatoes and you see what and you're like, whoa, like it takes me like five minutes to chop one potato and here they've got it diced and into tiny little hash browns in like five seconds. That would have, would have been like to, to watch Ivan painting, right? Okay, so let's move on to our next step here. Okay, so now that we've got our underdrawing transferred onto the canvas, then we put the imprimatura, and then we did a little bit of underpainting, Let's start putting some colors in place. Now I have called this background pass number one. A painting like this, I mean, technically we've got a background would be, you know, your the sky perhaps. We might consider this area in the middle as your middle ground and then this being the foreground. I think really I'm going to just think of like these passes as less background, middle ground, foreground as just like a layer of paint. And then we're going to sort of build this whole painting all at once. Now, it could be, um, th th this could be famous last words, but I, I think just in terms of this composition, that makes the most sense for me. So, uh, let's even get these side by side and think about the colors. Maybe I will start out with some cooler blues and blue cool blue grays back here right because we want this to, to be the furthest thing in this painting so let's get some white out because remember if we want something to look 
to, to go backwards in space, there's a few things we can do. We can use cool colors, because we put our cool colors in the background, and the warm colors in the foreground, we're gonna create a lot of space on its own. Another technique we can do is put darker colors, in, uh, or let's say more saturated colors in the foreground, and muted colors in the background. Just think about if you look at a mountain far in the distance, and you, I don't know, you hold up your, uh, you hold up a tube of paint, right? That tube of paint's gonna have a lot, be really bright, full of color. The mountain far off in the distance is gonna be almost a gray, very pastel-like color. So color saturation helps us see or create distance in a painting. And then value, right? contrast between light and dark so the darker like a black is going to go right on the in the foreground grays and whites are going to go backwards in space right again just think about like atmosphere mountains far away so by making this a little bit gray it's going to want to go backwards so what size of brush do i want Um, I'm going to start out with a little bit of white and I think I'm going to use th this right here. Remember was our cool blue and a little bit of our black. So I'm going to put a bit more of that. That's going to create a gray. Let's put a little bit more color in there. A little bit more white. I'm also going to add some matte medium into this, right? So medium is just clear paint. It's got no color or pigment in it. So it'll dry totally clear. And it's, uh, I like using this because it's gonna make this paint go a little bit thin and transparent. It also makes it a little bit easier to paint with. It feels like you've added water into it. Um, but instead of adding water, we've added medium, which keeps the paint nice and strong. Just looking at some of that, like that is an incredible color. Let's add, take a bit more yellow. In fact, I'm just gonna mix this to the side before I go. I think I'm gonna do this little bit here. So this is my cool yellow. And actually, I'm gonna put a bit more medium in here. Okay. You know, it kind of almost looks like he did this all over this whole area. So you know what, I'm just gonna start out. I'm just gonna paint this all over here. Now, that does not look like what we see on the left, but maybe that will, a little bit closer, right? When we don't have all of this surrounded and we add a little bit more blue there, I think that's gonna really change how we see this area. I'm just sort of wiping some of that paint away. Because there's this little area that also has a little bit of that color poking through. Okay, so I'm gonna leave that like that. I'm gonna come back to this color without even washing my brush. I don't mind if there's a bit of a yellow on there. 
and I'm just going to So these we're going to be painting kind of thin, so I don't want it to be. I still want to be able to see that yellow underneath everything. Okay, and these colors, that brown, that's going to be interesting. These in here. Okay. So let's try to get a bit of this color in here. I might even just take my cool yellow, mix this into this green right here. Let's add a little bit of. Oh, that's too much, but. So that's pretty good. I, it's again, it's hard to tell if it needs to be more greenish. So I think I'm just gonna leave this, and then as we glaze subsequent layers over top, we can darken it if we feel like, it, or we can make it more greenish if we want. Like I, it's may or may not be showing up on camera very well, but I think that's actually pretty close to the underlying color that's under here. Okay. Good question. Sandra says, why matte medium instead of glazing fluid? Um, so, good good question. Uh, one of the things, so we are going to be using plenty of glazing fluid for sure. And I, I use the satin glazing fluid, otherwise known as matte glazing fluid, right? So, even though this is, says matte and this says satin, they're essentially the, the same level of shine right? Um, the opposite of satin and matte is glossy, right? So I prefer to always, I, I prefer to use the same type of like uh, reflective level of, of my gla glazing fluid, mediums, um, slow dry medium and heavy gel, etc. I know pr probably the majority of people use glossy paint, but I always find glossy when it comes to acrylic paint makes it look very plasticky and maybe because i originally come from a, a, a oil paint background uh, that was something that was a big hurdle for me to overcome is which one of the reasons it took me so long to to, to get kind of into acrylic is i just could not stand that plasticky glossy quality so that's just a hang up of mine uh but to, sorry to answer your question sandra um Glazing fluid has um, uh, uh, a chemical in there that slows the drying time down. And it works really well to, to allow us to kind of blend a color out. I, I usually use matte medium at this stage in a painting because this is 
under going to be underneath a lot of other colors. So I usually just want it to dry as quickly as possible. I'm not really kind of trying to soften out the edges at, at all. So it's not, I can use the matte medium because it's going to dry much faster than glazing fluid will be. Glazing fluid is, I usually reserve for when I'm getting closer to refining the picture and I can get softer transitions uh, of value and and uh, color, etc. Good, great question. Um, okay, so what should we do next? I think, speaking of, just want to make sure it's kind of starting to dry. I think I want to have something a little bit warmer in the foreground here now, starting to get some warmer blues, which I don't even have on my palette yet. So let's So I'm going to take my, my some white and a little bit of warm blue. See how it automatically almost kind of goes a little bit grayish. I'm just going to mix some of my matte medium in here. and kind of just paint this over top. Now I think he would probably be much more careful about the way he's applying, well maybe, actually I, I, I don't know. It was, he's, he died 120 years ago. So we don't really have, don't know exactly how he would have painted, but I was going to say maybe he would have done this very much more carefully than I am, but it's also possible that he would have, even maybe more likely that he was going as fast or maybe even faster than I am. So right now I'm layering paint, right? So I've got my this kind of greenish slightly greenish color that's going to be underneath everything else and I'm taking this warmer blue and kind of bringing it into the foreground another really interesting thing just in doing research on this artist one of the things that he's also known for is sort of fading out the edges of his painting and so the edges of his painting tend to be like in the if you're standing in front of it looking at it the the, the edges seem to soften up a little bit and become a little bit more uh, impressionist uh, versus the center seems to be more, more have more focus to it um, so we can try to do a little bit of that just softening up those edges a little bit that would again come a little bit later in this process so that's where we are we're at oops reboot that that's where I'm at thus far here so let's I'm just gonna label this our next kind of pass here because now we've got basically just some some anchor colors in place and now we're going to start kind of layering on them so right now everything we've used the matte medium it's almost all dry to the touch we'll, I'll probably hit the blow dryer really quickly before we start adding the next color but what we have here 
is probably a good enough start to to the painting for the subsequent layers we're about to put on here. So I'm just going to mute the microphone. Okay, and as always, it's important to have a little bit of tea. Okay. So. Let's go back to the background and let's start doing a little bit of glazing here. So here's where we're going to use our glazing fluid. And that's going to work very similar to matte medium, but it's going to allow us to start kind of softening edges. And we can use really any brush to do this, but um, Ideally, like the, the best kind of brush to use is what we call a mop brush. And this is what a mop brush looks like when it's brand new. This is what a mop brush looks like after you've used it for about 40 or so paintings. You can see it kind of starts to spread outward, like it kind of blooms. You've got some stray hairs like the, that are on the edge. But either way, what we're using it for is to soften an edge. So if we paint some paint, we can then kind of just blur it or blend it outward but you can also use any other paintbrush you have now it's you really want it to be as dry as possible if it gets wet it's okay but just really try to you know wipe it off on your sleeve or on a paper towel or whatever to try to blot out as much because what happens then is is you're sort of scrubbing the paint off rather than kind of blurring it out and kind of spreading it out like you almost think of it as it's almost like buttering your toast, right? You, you'd you'd want to use a dry knife to spread the butter around. If you had water, if you had a knife that was dripping in water and you tried to butter your toast, the butter is just going to slip right off of your your uh, your knife. I don't, I don't think those analogies work. Um, it's almost the exact opposite, but uh, anyway. So I'm gonna use some of this, but let's mix this color up. It's gonna be something similar to this, but I think we wanna go just a little bit uh, darker. So I'm gonna take a little bit more white because I want this kind of a gray, not just a black, but I want a gray. In here, let's get a bit of blue. Maybe just a little bit more black. So this does have some matte medium current in there, but uh, we're going to add a lot more of this glazing fluid. The other thing too, with I always find with glazing fluid is after you've applied it, you've got maybe, depending on how much you put in there, but maybe like 10 seconds of working time. And then after that, you've got to really just let it dry, hit it with the blow dryer, and then add your next uh, bit of paint. Otherwise, it you really you can see it scraping up. And if you've watched a number of times, every time I I I'm upset at myself, it's because I didn't let the glazing fluid dry, and I got impatient and tried to work back into that paint after it had been applied. So let's go down here. This little bit of a gray. This is a little bit much, I think, but we can always get some blue back in on top of this. All right, so I'm just going to take just a regular brush. And just kind of soften the 
some of these edges. Now this is going to start getting paint on it, obviously, so that's again what's why I sort of just rubbed that paint off. And, I, and yes, I know this is a really dark area, but I want to build up my colors. I don't want to just add a big blob of black there. I want it to kind of feel like it's evolving organically. Um, Okay, so that's good. I'm going to blow dry that and then we'll add more layers. Maybe some with got a little bit more blue, some with less blue, some that are darker. And this is exactly what he would have done. He would have done probably 10 to 15 of these th and layers that are much thinner than what I've already done. Like I've already pushing this to go as fast as possible. The whole like to really get marine life as well as as skies really it's all about subtlety it's all about patience assuming you're painting in this method you're using the same method that he was using obviously the impressionists used a totally different method but this kind of glazing technique requires patience and subtlety right i'm gonna hit this with the blow dryer up here and then i might even darken without even changing my color a little bit so let's do that Okay, so the other thing too is, is you will, again, you'll see that these two side by side, like, I, by the time I had, you know, I had started painting with the matte medium up here, by the time I was down here, it was already dry, right? Whereas the glazing fluid, unless I, if I, if I don't hit it with the blow dryer, it's going to stay a little bit kind of shiny and, and wet, which is another reason why I like using matte mediums whether it's actual matte medium or a matte medium like this glazing fluid, right? Because when it's dry, it's not shiny. I can just see like, oh, okay, looks like I don't see any reflections. That means it's all dry. If you're using glazing or, or glossy mediums, it's like, is that dry or is that just the glossy medium? I don't know. All right, and then you kind of got to touch it. And, oh, I w wish I didn't touch that because I, now I got paint on my finger. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna let's do one that's got maybe a little bit more blue in it. And I'm gonna add a little bit of fluid to this. Maybe even a little bit more. The other thing too, when you're glazing, you usually want to have not too much paint on your brush because that can also make it harder to blend because then you just got, it's there's a lot of wetness to spread, right? So I can already f 
feel as I'm blending with this that the paint is sort of drying on the tips of the, the bristles here. Let's blow dry this. Okay, now let's, uh, let's take this color, let's make it darker now, let's go darker. And I'm going to add, actually no, I'm, I'll do this separately, I was going to add a little bit of red in here, but I think I'm going to do a little bit of a cold red in, in a few places in the sky as a separate thing. Let's just take even more darker color. might do one more darker pass in here and then move on to this area up front uh, just because I don't want to get too far I don't want to I don't want to sort of try to complete that part of the painting be like okay done the top half let's move to the bottom half because I don't know what this is gonna look like yet and I don't want to get this all done and be totally satisfied and then go oh now that I've used those colors there and that value there, I've got to do this, and then now I've got to go back and fix this. So that's why it's kind of nice to kind of work, uh, kind of go back and forth in areas and do the whole composition at one time. So let's just blow dry this. So this brush now is is getting close to the point where I want to put it in water and use a different brush or let this dry. Also, I want to do maybe just one little bit more and then I'm going to put my blending brush into the water. So let's get... See, so I'm kind of spacing the darker areas out. I, want, I don't want just one big clump of shadow in the clouds. I want there to be some variety. 
Like clouds aren't just one big solid shape there. They've got different masses in different places. And So as I said, I know this is going to get much darker, but I want to build it up slowly rather than just taking a big... Because I could just take a big blob of black and go, blah, blah, all done. Let's, let's wait till we get there. So let's move into the foreground. As I said, this one here is now probably going to do more damage than good if I continue to try to use it for blending. Because now it's got so much paint on it that I might end up leaving paint instead of blending paint away. It's also getting a little bit harder, so like the, the frosted tips are... Uh, could end up kind of scratching and almost like drawing onto the surface. And I should all, like, I, it's, it's important to know that that's not necessarily always a bad thing. Like, it's possible that you could, you might do that, and you're like, oh, I don't like that, but then later on you're trying to think, like, how do I get this effect? Oh, remember how I was doing that here with the Ivazovsky painting? I want to use that technique which was wrong for this technique kind of approach but perfect for this other approach right there's never a technique that is just all wrong all the way across the board I'm mean, just like some work better for different things okay so let's do we've, we've been using a bit cooler colors back here let's use some warmer colors and start putting some of this warmer blue into the foreground here so again, let's take our warm blue, and that's like, whoa! You know, we may get close to that as a glaze towards the end here like that, but that's a little intense. So let's take some white. Let's even take a bit of our dark color, make a bit of a gray, but this is a warmer gray. Okay. And then again, let's take our glazing fluid, and mix this. In here. And then I just try to get a little bit of that excess off. And let's Use this brush here. I can't remember what I used it for, but I used it already, and now it's nice and dry, and I'll be able to do a little bit of blending with it. So, let's put some up here. You can see that I'm kind of losing some of the detail like some of the, my underdrawing there is kind of disappearing. It's it's both it's a, a little bit be, just because um, I'm gonna kind of do my own thing to a certain extent at, at least with this stage of the painting. So you can see, like, I just put that there and it's like I kind of blended away. It's like, well, what was the point of doing that? It's just kind of gone. Well, it's not gone. It's changed this color just a little bit, and then that's going to influence every subsequent layer of thin glazes I put over top of it.
this kind of grayish stuff in the foreground here. So I'm kind of just looking for the darker areas of this painting, and this, I haven't put any more glazing fluid on this brush too, so it's, it's almost like I'm kind of dry brushing with glazing fluid, and then just softening that out. surface. Um, let's, I'm going to blow dry this, right? Because again, if I start trying to do something to this, I'm going to wipe what I just did away. And then you get these like weird areas where it looks like you've, you're, you're, it looks like you've cleaned something away, right? And anyone who's ever you know, tried to clean your walls and like maybe like we have a daughter and let's say she's something splattered onto the wall and you're like oh I'm just gonna wipe that away and then you're like oh I didn't realize how dirty the wall was oh now we got a nice clean white spot on the wall and everything's kind of so it's that same sort of thing like if you start clean like brushing into glazing fluid while it's still wet you're gonna wipe that paint away and then you're like oh no should we go for next let's do let's do just a little bit more of this same color remember that's our warm blue uh, white and our bit of our black and obviously glazing fluid right So, some t so here's where I can, I'm not just smudging everything, I'm just sort of just blending more of the outside edges. Okay. Let's do this, um, our blue, but this time we will use mostly blue and glazing fluid. 
Actually, I should blow dry that too, right? Let's just do that. Okay, so I'm going to take some glazing fluid all on its own, and I'm going to take my, my warm blue and just blend in here. So now what we've got is the color at full strength, but we're, we've made it more transparent. So rather than, we haven't added any white or black or any other colors to it, it's that same color but it's just, it's, the pigment is spread out. So we can take this. Need more of it. I was hoping we could start getting, I think we're going to have to use a bit of a cold blue and a bit more of like an emerald quality in here. So we might have to, I'll just add a little bit of that color, maybe next. I'm going to blow dry this, because this right now is going a little bit more grassy green. So we need this to be a little bit more of a cooler green. So I want, I'm just curious, what if we take some of our cool blue and our cool yellow, just like that. Notice it's very thin because I'm going to use my glazing fluid. Without any uh, white or anything. Let's just see. It's a little bit closer to an emeraldy color. Oh, okay. So it looks like if I 
paint that a bit over some white. That really is really helpful. So, I'm going to add just a bit of white onto my paintbrush here. Okay, see, this is what happened. I should have um, <laughs> blow dried that because I can see that I'm wiping some of that paint away. So, this is my. This has got just a little bit of white in there. It helps. Kind of going a little overboard with that green, but I kind of like it. So <laughs> we are going to cover a lot of it up, but oops, I should just have left that. Let's just leave it. Maybe I will take a bit more. Actually, I'm going to blow dry this, but I'm just going to take a bit more of white in here and put that down in a few places. So I'm taking this white and I'm just going to paint this in here and then probably go back over it with a bit more. I was hoping I could get away with it with the color that was there, but I don't think it was going to be cool enough. So painting this white. Now I'm going to clean that because I don't want any white on the paint for my next mixture. And this was my blending brush from before. It's been sitting there, but it's still a little bit wet. Like I can feel it's a little bit cold on my skin, right? So I want it to dry even more. Let's blow dry that.
Okay. So let's go back here with my cool blue and cool yellow. Uh, let's maybe do a bit more yellow. Lots of glazing fluid there. Now, I get that little bit of frosty, cold, watery green that I wanted. All of this is super subtle, so it wouldn't surprise me if barely any of this shows up on camera, which doesn't make for the most exciting episode. At, the, or at least at this stage here, right? Okay, but I feel really confident about where this painting's at at this exact moment. Okay, so we'll blow dry that. Maybe we'll, I'll then actually, I think I'm, what I'm gonna do next is to start putting a little bit more detail in the foreground here. And then we'll go back up. I think we'll finish the sky. I mean, we could work on this painting for another six or seven hours easily, easily. But my goal is to finish in about an hour and a half at the latest, right? So But I bet you by the time by the end of his life, and I sorry, I just cleaned my other blending brush, right? So I can go and use a different one to do um, future blending here, but because both of these are kind of still a bit wet. Right? One of the things I have to do is just wipe them on my pants, on a rag. You can literally use your blow dryer to blow on them. The only thing is if you use your blow dryer, you probably don't want to blow directly in. You want it to sort of maybe blow away so it's not going to make these bloom outward. Sanders says, Michael, you know, I was using glazing medium for the under layers before, and I'm noticing a huge difference with the matte medium. Thank you for the explanation. Interesting. Yeah, just a slightly different material can, can cause a bit of a different uh, result, for sure. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm going to blow dry this real quick. So I don't, I think we're, would be technically background pass number two. I'm not going to quite go into the background just yet because I want to do a little bit more work in the quote unquote foreground. Um, what I want to do is I want to add a little bit of red and a little bit of purples into both the, the background and the foreground here. Because if we look at this painting, we can see there's kind of a little bit of this little brown quality in in here. So I want to get a bit of that warm brown. And again, just a very subtle 
amount. We're not gonna use too much of these colors, but we'll take, um, what was the brush I was just using? Let's take this warm yellow, take a bit of warm red, Let's take some warm blue. The more blue we put into that color, the darker it's going to be, but I think that's what I want. Okay. So usually I make that mixture and then I put it off to the side. I'm also just going to wipe off all this excess, right? Because we want this to be a thin layer. We can even see if I just mix it right in, what that color looks like. I've got a bit of red on there. Now it's pretty saturated. That's okay. Let's, it's okay for it to be a little bit intense. Take this, get a different blending brush. Probably being much more careful about this than I am, but it's the luxury of time. All right, so I kind of want to get a little bit more of that, so I'm just going to blow dry. Take that same brown. That's okay. Not exactly perfect, but good enough. So we'll blow dry. In fact, yeah, let's blow. Do I need to? Let's. let's I'm just gonna. I'm gonna be working in a slightly different area, so I don't think I'll blow dry that. Looking for a part of this palette that hasn't been used. Right, these colors look very saison like right now, which I love. Just gonna do a little bit of a glaze with some of this warm or very cool red. Just a little bit 
on here. And maybe I'll just use a bigger brush here. Very subtle, which I want. Yeah, I just keep on adding more and more color to it. Um, So I've now got this just little hint of, of kind of pinky colors in the sky. And it's sort of like an old artist's trick to use a little bit of the opposite color in your painting. Actually, I do want to put a bit of it here, so I'm just going to blow. I'm going to take also just a little bit of my warm red and mix this into this color. Since we're coming up closer to the front of the canvas. That's a lot of color, but that's all right, whatever. So I love this. I love that now we've got all of this color and now we can glaze blues over top of it and we'll, it, we can preserve as much or get rid of as much as we want. But now we've got uh, a, an ocean that's just teeming with all sorts of colors underneath the surface. And I would I imagine that he would have done this same sort of thing but even more, he would have really built this. He probably would have spent the majority of his time doing this exact thing, which, you know, you can do on a really large surface really easily. Um, and I think that's probably, you know, when he was doing his demos going around the world or Europe, really. Western Europe, I imagine this is sort of the area that would have been really exciting for a young peop, uh, artist to see like you can imagine the 70 year old guy getting up in front of like the royal academy in london or uh l'ecole des beaux-arts in paris and doing this kind of thing but then afterwards doing much finer detail and he probably would that would have taken a long time so he probably would have had a giant canvas like this we're talking like five or six feet wide like a like a big blackboard 
And imagine him doing this sort of thing and then saying, okay, I'm just going to do a little bit of the waves and then we'll call it a day. But now, I'm just thinking off the top of my head. If you were a young artist in like 1870 and you saw a painting like this, you could think of how like the impressionists would be like, hey, I... I I like the painting like this. Why don't... Couldn't you just stop right there? And he would... Oh, are you kidding me? This is just halfway through the painting. Now we got to go to all the details. And even though I don't think... Mon I, I mean, I have to do research. I don't know if there were any Impressionists in those classes. They, Some of them were academically trained, but not all of them. But you could... Like, this is very similar to how Monet would have built his canvases up like the water lily series which we will do we're going to do a few water lilies uh, over the next few months but they would have just said that's pretty good i don't know i think i'm kind of done which ugh, for someone from the academic tradition would have been like oh my what have i done what have i shown people this is not done this is just this is meant to be covered up with more paint i just it's <laughs> because he becomes uh, Ivanovsky becomes the the sort of symbol of the academic tradition. So for the impressionists and the, then later on the avant garde, they would have looked at this and been like, "Are you kidding me?" You know, like what what would be the the analogy? Um. This is sort of like I don't know, uh, have have like uh, Guns and Roses and Poison and Aerosmith to like Nirvana and and hip hop music. They're just like, oh my goodness, Axl Rose. He's you know from a different different time period, right? Where, so those kind of musicians in the early 90s, they they saw that kind of heavy metal hairband stuff as being really outdated. Obviously, there's Aerosmith and Guns N' Roses and all those bands, you know, sort of kind of took a little bit of a, a break on the side while, you know, hip hop and grunge music, you know, uh, took over. And then, hey, things seem to go back in cycles, and then they, they're back in favor, and they tour around. And same sort of thing with Ivanovsky. Like, um, his work sort of when it fell into obscurity for, a, for a, a, a long time, until maybe like the 50s and 60s, where artists, again, the, the artists who were rebelling against the avant-garde want to look back and say, like, yeah, all that Picasso and Matisse, all that kind of cubist garbage. Let's go back to, like, people who really knew how to paint. And then they paint for a while, and then another generation comes along, like, ah, oh, those old fogies, right? <laughs> uh, okay. So... Um, I love how that looks. <laughs> I really like that. Okay. It obviously doesn't look anywhere near what we have on the left there, but we're building there. We're building there. We would, we're going to need lots more glazing layers to go. Um, so what should we do next? I think let's go into... Maybe let's let's finish the background. Let's, let's do that. So we're going to use some cool blues up here. And we can just glaze to our heart's content until we're satisfied. I mean, I kind of like the sky like that, to be honest. I do think maybe I want to darken that a little bit. But if someone said I had to leave it like that, I, I could leave it like that. I wouldn't be too bothered. So, let's get... Uh, we want a blending brush again. More, more so than ever, this is where we want to be doing very soft blending. Because we've... As we keep on building up these glazing layers, we want those glazing layers for us to not see where the brush strokes are, right? But totally the opposite of Van Gogh, who um, is doing most of his work in the 1800s, right? So this, this painting was made around the very same time that Van Gogh dies, right? So you can see that there's, they're in two 
they're in this existing on the planet at the same time, but they couldn't be approaching painting in them any more differently. Those are look pretty dry. Okay, that one's a little bit wet, so we'll paint with this one. So I'll put my glazing fluid there. Now let's take some cool blue. Now let's just glaze with pure um, cold blue and just see how well that looks. Very subtle. Like that. Let's do a little bit more. So I'll, let's blow dry. Uh, I'm just wondering, should I just go right to? Look, you know what? I'm going to take a bit of this same because we're the the water will reflect this color, so we can put a bit of cold blue down here as well. Not as much, and it's just in a few places. But if I'm going to use the blow dryer, let's just and we got this color on our brush. Let's just use it. Smudging it around a little bit. Okay. I'll blow dry that. Sandra says, um, this is one of my favorite paintings. Even though mine looks like a puddle, I think I love glazing. You can really see how fun this is. Like, like if I was to say mix that color, be like, I have, I don't know. I mean, I see some blue, I see some red, I see some yellow, I see some green. And if we tried to mix all those colors together, we would just get this blob, blob of mud, right? Brown. But, but we've mixed all these different colors together, and yet we, there's some kind of weird, complex thing that's resulting in there, which is just lovely. Okay, so this is a color we mixed right off at the beginning, or near the beginning. This was our cool blue and gray, or sorry, our dark color, and so our basically black and white, right? And together they make gray. So I'm just going to glaze a little bit more with this. And actually, I think I need to go a little bit darker. And I'm just going to push things further here, right? Again, the, the the best results for this happen when you go very slowly, which is exactly the opposite of what I'm just about to do. Is just try to go a little bit faster for the sake of finishing the painting in a reasonable amount of time.
Okay. So I wanted to get a darker up here, but I think that's for another layer. Um. You know, I'm going to put a bit of this. I was just about to blow dry it, and I'm like, you know what? Let's just use a bit of this in here, even though it's a colder blue. It's still kind of like our mid mid range or, or, or middle uh, uh, middle ground. I mean.
let's take a bit more of our dark color. You can see it's even a little bit purpley, that dark color, which is I think is fine. I like that. I like that it's a little bit darker or a little bit has a bit of color to it. I might just leave that like that. I kind of like it. It's uh, it's fine. Maybe. So let's paint the the blue in the foreground here. And then we're gonna start doing the like the white caps and the froth and all that stuff. So we're making good good time here. Again, this is our other blending brush since we're moving into a different area. I want to clean it because I don't want all that paint to dry. That'll dry. I have another blending brush nice and ready to go. So let's, we want to use our warm blue again. With lots of glazing fluid. And it never hurts to add a little bit extra glazing fluid. Because you can always, do you know it's if it's a little bit too thin well just add a little bit more color to it but if it's too th opaque then you have to wipe it away and, and do it again so Another thing too, when I'm glazing, I want to think about like moving the brush strokes in the direction of, of the water and trying to kind of, so that I don't just have this just going straight across. I'm trying to kind of go within the, the waves, right?
Let's just keep on going. <laughs> my wife has our daughter and another child uh, upstairs trying to take care of them simultaneously which is uh, a difficult thing to do <laughs> okay so I'm going to blow dry this Okay, so I think I'm going to do just one more little pass here with this blue, and then I'm going to start adding white caps and stuff. That's, I, I love how that's looking. Like, there's so much depth of color in here. That's so cool. Um, but I want to now just sort of transition to doing the water. Or the all of the foamy, watery stuff.
because we could keep on doing this forever and it looks really great but let's we need to give some structure back into this picture so So the next thing we're going to do here is start putting some of that little um, white foam and froth and white caps and all that stuff onto this painting. Uh, because I think we've, we've got, it looks pretty cool, oops, right like this. Um, I'm going to blow dry that in a moment as soon as this boots back up again. Um, but we got lots of little patches of wet uh, paint here. So come on, let's go. Reboot that. Deborah's making pies and fruit sauces. Mmm. Here we go. Okay, so I'm 100% confident that this is roughly what this painting looked like at one point in the process. That we had basically the colors like this. The next step is the step that I'm a little bit less confident about being able to pull off. So part of me is just like, let's just leave it like this and let's, uh, how about let's end the session a little early today, folks. Hey, how about that? This is where um, we have to maybe be a little bit more focused on details because we're going to start painting with a little bit of white. With It also has some matte or uh, glazing fluid in it. So we'll take our glazing fluid. I'm just going to put it right in with my um, uh, blue here and add some white into this. Because I don't want it to be pure white. I want to save my, my pure white for the very, very end because that's going to give like really nice pops of of uh, highlights. Oh, you know what? I guess before I, I could have used instead of just wiping it off, I could use the same color for these areas up here. That's wet. That's dry. So we're going to build everything up with little, by going slowly like this, rather than just launching right in. It's nice and we we'll just take our time.
<laughs> okay, so let's zoom in and let's just kind of get a little bit closer for the first time today. I think, are we in the same place? There, I think we're close. So it's like we're kind of drawing like little veins. Why you come here, darling? Okay, well, let's take a little second. Here, where are you? Come here. Come here. See your big happy smile. You gonna go for a walk with mommy and Addy? Sorry. Sorry, everybody. We're gonna go. Really? <laughs> okay. Okay, let's go back here. So it's we're just going to do this, just keep building things up, and I want to try to get these... kind of little patterns that are created in the water. They're like little cells or... And this is the kind of thing where, um, you know, I'm not, I'm going to do my best to sort of look at the original for reference, but at some point I just have to just allow it to be its own. Otherwise I'm going to spend all this time really looking at the screen where I want to be spending more time looking at my painting, right? In fact, I think I'm, I need to keep that zoomed out. I'm 
kind of right up here. I think there's something right about here, right? Now I'm kind of down here. I'm also going to add maybe just a little bit of cool blue into this mixture just for some fun. Now I'm kind of in the bottom right corner. Here, let's move that over.
So we'll go back over top of a lot of these lines later on with white. And it'll all make more sense. So now I'm kind of up in this area here. Looking at this area right there. And there's this kind of spray. slowly but surely in fact let's just zoom out and just see how that's looking at this stage not bad Do, let's take a bit more white and glazing fluid. Maybe this time I'll take a bit of warm blue and put it on there.
So I'm going over some lines, creating new lines. It's like I'm trying to be as um, random as possible. Just like the, the water might be, right? Uh, 
Paula says, hi, Michael. She's being dressed too warm. <laughs> um, well, I don't know what it's like in Edmonton right now, but here in, in Vancouver, it's been pretty chilly. We had really nice weather yesterday, and then today was quite cold. And so they're outside playing in the yard right now. So we don't want anybody to catch a cold. So, um, yeah. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to blow dry this now. And I'm actually going to do a little bit of blue back over top of some of this white. Right? Um, in, in fact, actually, you know what? I'm just going to, yeah, let's, let's do that right now. Because I'm going to start wrapping up. So I'm not going to fiddle with this forever. Okay, so there's some warm blue. Let's take some glazing fluid. And I'm just going to glaze over top of some of the places where I already put some white, which will both sort of kind of darken, but it also kind of will bring some of that um, white to life, actually, oddly enough. seems to deepen the color a little bit. Let's take just a bit more of it. Again, there's no white in this. This is just glazing fluid, matte glazing fluid, and warm blue. And maybe it's worth just also going in now. And just showing you what I'm about to start doing is I want to start painting in individual little pockets of of water here and I can just make these up right. sometimes I'm going over top of the white and then sometimes I'm just sort of painting in and around those shapes This is what's going to be, uh, I think, probably most effective. And I'm kind of racing to do it, but really this would be the kind of thing you would spend days on, really trying to kind of paint in between some of these things. And, and with lots of different colors, not just blue, we might do blue, but we might do one with a little bit of green and some cool blue. Oh yeah, we're getting a really nice wave forming here now. really starts to feel like we're, we're seeing the underside of this this wave right there so you can see I'm not doing everything I'm sort of looking to create these cells
this is starting to look really cool like up close i'm not sure how how effective that looks but remember like that's the size of a finger most people aren't going to get this close to the painting ever Even more. Um, I'm just now taking just a little bit of my dark. Well, it's a lot more than I was expecting, but that's okay. Put my my dark color and glazing, and so took my warm blue, a little bit of my black and glazing fluid together. Maybe I'll, I should blow dry this too. gives you an idea of what it looks like when we're zoomed for a little bit further zoomed out right And I just tap with a little bit of the brush just to get some of the brush strokes out. Just to soften everything out just a little bit. So what this is also doing is helping to kind of clarify these kind of little cells and give like little shadows. Like the white is where there's some light um, hitting that foam. So it's gonna really pop. But we also gonna have some shadows. Just as we have highlights, we're gonna have shadows. So we wanna 
try to I mean, when I'm more and more when I look up at the original, the more I like. Oh, well, that's pretty different. That's not in the original. Like this whole area on the bottom right, especially, is is quite different. I mean, let's let's take a look. I'm gonna add a little bit more white back into here, but. So I think last thing to do here is really to amp up some of the whites now. We've got a lot of, this is kind of m very muted so far, but to get that glow that he has on his painting, we need to get the white up. I'm pretty satisfied with the darker areas. I feel like that's good. Um, so I'll start out, actually, let's, uh, let's just go right to the white, Let, right? Let's just do that. Let's get some. Got white and glazing fluid. The more glazing fluid I have on there, the more transparent it'll be, and the more play I have, the more subtlety I can go for. So I might do a little bit of blending, but for the most part here, I want to just, I'm just doing tiny little, like a little line work.
so I'm just kind of approaching this area kind of to the right here Let's do the bottom down here. I'm just going to go right to the bottom corner. Oops. Big blob of white I didn't want. Oops. This is also a little area where you could potentially add some hidden symbols and words, faces, all sorts of nutty stuff artists have been known to do in the in waves or clouds. Just by all means, if that appeals to you, go for it. And so we could do this kind of thing for hours and hours and hours, days on end. And we're going to get a super cool look. Obviously it just takes time. Um, and not only, so we would build this up and then we might go back over and darken it again. So that it looks sort of like those are underneath one set of waves and water. In fact, I can, I'll probably do a little bit of that shortly.
Gonna take a bit of warm blue. Just do a bit of. Um, I want to do just a little bit more of a glaze with my warm blue. And then I'll, we'll, uh, in fact, let's Okay, so I just want to do a few little finishing touches, just darken and lighten in a few small areas, and then we're going to be done. So, um, uh, again, we could continue working on this for many, many hours, but uh, we will have to wrap up. So I'm just, I've gotten a little bit of my warm blue. I had a little bit of my black left over in here, and I'm just going to... Again, just darken a few more areas. That's probably enough for that. And then just last little bit here is take some white and glazing fluid. Maybe just a little bit more glazing fluid. Don't want to go too wild. And my last few brush strokes here.
Now I'm just going to take almost pure white with barely any medium in it. Just more and more white. Right, like this, adding these little bits of boom, white on top really helps give it that sea foam quality. And not in a lot of places, but just Okay, I think good enough for government work, right? It's the 24th. It's that time, everybody, to do a little wrap-up and take a look at these two paintings side-by-side. Side. My version and the original by I. Vysosky. Um And so maybe just before we do that, just a quick remembrance to like, subscribe, hit the notification bell so you know when new and unscheduled videos are going to appear. 
as well as take a photograph of your artwork, upload it to the Facebook group so that we can share in the glory of your creation. And once a month, I offer some suggestions. I go through all of the artwork that's on the Facebook group and we gather together and we just talk about the work and I give maybe some ways it could be improved as well as just celebrate the great work that you guys have done. I think anybody who's making artwork is doing the world a favor. And if you found today's uh, episode worth the price of a cup of coffee, consider leaving a donation, PayPal or the YouTube super chat, etc. So we'll look at them side by side. Um, you know, definitely different, different paintings. I, um, I think I could have, you know, I've got this kind of green in there that I like. I may have even a little bit overdid it. I could probably have darkened and made this even more blue over here. Probably to maybe more isolate, uh, these, the rays coming through. So I could really see that being more blue. And just sort of leaving it there but I don't know I just sort of got into it <laughs> and wanted to keep it like that now obviously you know he's got a little bit more of like a baby blue using the warm blue and white that he's done a fantastic genius job of doing maybe even more so in in this area and even down here I've just sort of run out of time and I haven't been able to to to, to do this entirely justice the way that I would like but you know I think it's not bad as it is so we're basically looking at the the same places maybe this is up just a little bit higher obviously the the waves also took different shapes like trying to mimic the waves exactly as they appear is just a fool's errand um, maybe let's look at this area So even the sky, I, I allowed to kind of stay a little bit lighter. We, I, I maybe could have darkened that much more and just let that little bit of, of light shining in down there. Um, let's just look down here on the bottom of that painting. Obviously, I kind of just went off on my own. And as I said, it might have been a better idea just to allow all of that to be baby blue. Do, do I dare just doing a quick little wash of it? I don't know. This is a bad idea. What if... What if I take my warm blue? And what if I do just kind of go over oops well, it wasn't the smartest thing because there's still wet paint there so let me just is really I'm trying to just focus some attention back into the center of the painting here same sort of thing
And since I smudged a bit of this, I'm just going to come back in here. This has got white with a little bit of baby blue. Okay, I'm just gonna leave it. Okay, I'm gonna stay here all, all night painting. Um, let's go back over here to the far right. And, you know, I'm, I'm happy with the, like the translucency of the, of the paint. And I think um, it does give like that sense of, uh, of like depth that we want. Sorry, just see. Um, getting spammed. So, um, yeah. I mean, I could, if I had another couple of hours, I think we could even go 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 further on there. But let's go up to the top. And I guess this could also ah have been darker oops up top here much darker but the one thing I didn't want to do was to get this too dark so it would kind of compete with the foreground someone <laughs> like Ivan uh, um, um, Ava Zofsky was uh, really great at managing like those value contrasts me less so right this is a one of the great paintings of all time so it's a little tricky uh this could have been a little softer in here too that's a little chunky anyway um let's call it a day there folks thanks so much for painting along with me on thursday we're going to be looking at Washington crossing the Delaware, one of the most famous paintings in American art history and art history in general. Um, we're probably going to do a little focus on one or two of the characters, figures that are in th that boat, uh, because otherwise it would take us a few months, <laughs> 20 episodes or more to do. So thanks, everybody. We'll see you guys on Thursday. Enjoy the rest of your evening or morning, wherever you are, on our beautiful planet. And we'll see you guys again very soon. <laughs> okay. Good night, everybody. We'll talk to you soon.